my pleasure to introduce today's, or to this afternoon's plenary speaker, Dr. Charles Falco. Uh, Dr. Falco has joint appointments in optical sciences and physics here at the University of Arizona, where is he? he is also the chair of the condensed matter portion of the physics department. He's a fellow of four professional societies, the American Physical Society, IEEE, OSA, and SPIE. He's published over 250 scientific manuscripts, uh, co-edited two books, has seven patents, and has given over 400 invited talks at conferences. In addition to his scientific research, he, has co he was co-curator of the Simon R. Guggenheim Museum's The Art of the Motorcycle, which, with over two million visitors in New York, Chicago, Bilboa, and the Guggenheim Las Vegas, was by far the most successful exhibition of industrial design ever assembled. More recently, his worries to reach that what he's going to talk about today, he and the world-renowned artist David Hockney found artists of such repute as Van Eyck, Fellini, Caravaggio, that they used optical projections in creating portions of their work. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Charles Falcon. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad you're staying here. So I understand I'm supposed to take less than two hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will try, but I have no promises. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm going to try to convince you by the end of the talk that this may be the only talk, science talk, you'll ever hear that really is appropriate to start with a fanfare of trumpets. <laughs> Some acknowledgments. Um, David Graves and Richard Smith are David Hockney's assistants in his studios in uh, England and in Los Angeles. I'll tell you about David Hockney a little bit in a moment. Um, Jose Sassian is one of my colleagues here in optical sciences. I'm not going to show any results he calculated, but very early on, he did some ray tracing calculations for us that um, were very useful in our helping establish our thinking. But I'm not going to show those results today. <coughs> uh, Martin Kemp is an art historian who um, helped David Hockney in his early thinking. And I'll tell you about um, Alton Guilfoyle and Lawrence Weschler in a second. I'm going to cover a lot of material today. If you want to know more about this, it, um, all of this is on an optical sciences website, but it's like 14 levels embedded deep, and <laughs> nobody will ever remember the URL. So at no small cost to myself, I purchased the domain name art-optics.com. <laughs> and so if you go to art-optics.com, um, it will just bounce you to the optical sciences website. And since I know there's always somebody who's dyslexic in the audience, I also purchased <laughs> optics hyphen art. <laughs> <laughs> so you can easily go to those websites and get more information. So I'm going to give you an introduction to what this is all about. Talk about optics in medieval times because that's essential to understand what was possible for the early Renaissance artists like Jan van Eyck to do. Then optics. I'm going to go over this very quickly. I'm going to remind you very quickly of things that all of you know, um, but you may not have thought about in the context I'm going to show them. Then I'm going to show optical evidence in selected paintings, different kinds of optical evidence in different paintings that show artists as early as Jan van Eyck, 1432, almost 200 years before Galileo, was using optical projections to help him capture certain features in portions of painting. And then we'll conclude by, hopefully by nine o'clock tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so as an introduction, who is David Hockney, my co-author on all of this? Well, two respected dictionaries of art and artists, most uh, critically acclaimed British artists of his generation, perhaps the greatest of modern portraitists. David Hockney is a world-class artist. He, he can look at paintings. He understands what's required to do certain features. He knows his own skill level. So when he looked at a, a painting, and he did his early training, the uh, Royal College or Academy of Art in London. He's been looking at Jan, a particular Jan van Eyck painting that we'll talk about today, the Arnold King and Mary, for his entire career. And it's not like he looked at the painting and said, well, Van Eyck is better than me. He could, you know, I wish I were that good. It was like, how did he do certain features? I know my skill level. I know what I'm capable of doing. And he's done something that's beyond it. It's equivalent to, um, I don't know, you uh, taking several days to solve some integral. And one of your student colleagues comes back with a solution three minutes later. 
And you think, well, I mean, sorry, I'm pretty smart. I'm not the smartest one in the room, but three minutes when it takes me so long to do that, something else must have been involved, like a computer. <laughs> but, um, so you can tell, because of your own skill level, you're willing to concede that, that other people know more than you, but you know, you know um, if it's so far beyond what is possible, you know something else was involved. And so he kept coming back and worrying about certain paintings. David Hockney, our most celebrated living artist. He is considered to be one of Britain's greatest contemporary artists. His originality and skill have ensured his success from the beginning of his career. So he's a world-class artist, and I've been collaborating with him on this, and the thing that was essential for us to make these discoveries... I, mean, I admit, for instance, I'm, I am interested in pictures. I keep saying this. I'm interested in uh, how you make pictures. How do you make pictures? He's been interested in this. Unlike, I mean, most of the audience is young, so um, you won't have experienced this quite yet. But when you're at your age, you want to maybe do some experiment. And there is no tool to do some experiment. You've got some real clever experiment you're going to do, and there's no tool that allows you to do it. It hasn't been invented yet. Well, 20 years later in your career, you may experience this phenomenon where you realize this, there is now a tool that has been invented that um, will allow me to measure at attoseconds some uh, light pulse. And I had this clever idea 30 years ago or 20 years ago. Now I'll go back and I can do that experiment. Well, many people, non-scientists in particular, you, you see something you don't understand, you go, oh, don't understand it, and you go on. David didn't go on. And he went back and was worried about these things for years. How I got involved was this article appeared in The New Yorker in January 2000. My co-curator of the art of the motorcycle, Alton Guilfoyle, who I acknowledge, and I also acknowledge Lawrence Weschel, who wrote the article, um, knows I'm interested in optics, I'm interested in art. He called me here in Tucson in my office and said, Falco, I don't care what you're doing, drop it. Go by the New Yorker, read this article, and call me back. Sadly, the New Yorker doesn't get to Tucson the same day it gets to New York. <laughs> so there was like a three or four day delay before the story advanced. So I'm three or four days behind where we could have been. And Arrangements were made for me to visit David Hockney's studio and for him, me to see what was going on. And there's a whole story behind that, which there isn't time to go into right now. But one of the odd things in life, I work in molecular beam epitaxy um, of ultra-thin films for a variety of purposes. My dream in life, you know, 30 years ago, was maybe in the next edition of the solid state physics textbook, um, on page 97, there might be a, a figure you know, uh, with reference number 27 next to it, and you look at reference 27, it says, uh, Charles Falco means this curve, it goes up and down, and it <laughs> means a curve that goes up and down to go here, and so we acknowledge it. That would have been great. Well, the European Science Foundation organized a workshop around our discovery. Uh, two years ago in Florence, the, um, another workshop was organized around uh, exactly what Hockney and I had discovered. I got to give a talk in the library of the Uffizi Museum. It doesn't get better than that. It's even better than this auditorium. <laughs> so, so our thesis, which is important, is all the paintings I'm going to show you, and, and I could really talk at you for easily 12 hours, longer than that, seriously, with the evidence we've collected. Um, they come from the major museums in the world. All the paintings are in the Prado, the Uffizi, the Hermitage. They're paintings that if you believe the directors of those mu museums, what their attendance figures are, and there's reasons not to believe them, but if you did believe them, 25 million people a year see the same paintings we saw and didn't realize what we'd realized. So um, it pays to pay attention because uh, have we discovered something or not? If you ask most scholars, when were optical instruments invented? If I ask you, uh, some of you probably say, well, Galileo, and some of you who know the history a little bit better would say, well, not really Galileo, he stole the idea, but it was around 1600. Um, mirrors only reflect images. 99.9% .9 of the people in the world would agree with the statement. Mirrors reflect images. If you want to focus an image, you need a lens. Renaissance masters work by sheer genius alone. What I'm going to show you today is correct. All of these statements are wrong. Not wrong on technicalities, fundamentally wrong. So it goes to the foundations of a liberal arts education in college. 
If we go back in time and look at attempts to represent the human form, the three-dimensional human form in two dimensions, which is not an easy problem. Uh, we see 4,000 years ago that this person, one thing we can see is he can paint better than I can. <laughs> but it's flat, it's two-dimensional. We come forward in time, more elaborate, but still flat and two-dimensional. We come to Jan van Eyck. If I magnify this person, how did he get that realism? If this guy walked in right now, or walked from behind the screen right now, all of you would immediately recognize him. How did Van Eyck create that realism? Well, in fact, there's a strong clue right in the painting itself. <laughs> <laughs> Every feature that we in the show is based on optics could have been done with one lens of a pair of reading spectacles. Reading spectacles are specified in diopters usually. You go to a drugstore, you see a pair of uh, uh, just inexpensive plastic reading spectacles on the back uh, of shelf someplace. They're one, 1 1.5, 2. Those are diopters. So one is the focal length in meters divided, or is one divided by the focal length in meters. That's one diopter. So somebody my age will wear reading glasses of one and a half or two diopters. Every place that we can show and can extract the focal length, it's around one and a half or two diopters. We were told originally, David Hockey and I were told originally by our historians that um, they didn't have lenses back at the time of Van Eyck, so they couldn't possibly have projected images. Turns out that was wrong. I mean, you can see it right here. Um, but it turns out it was wrong, but it also was helpful, um, bad advice, because I said to David, well, but of course they could have projected images with concave mirrors. David didn't know that. Nobody knows that. that that's one of those things that um, most of the people, 99% of the people in the world, don't know. And then, uh, not very long later, I came across this painting. And I said to a very well-respected art historian, well, what do you mean they didn't have lenses? What's this? And the person said to me, and I swear to you, they said, well, we knew they had spectacles, but they didn't have lenses. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you're trained outside of the sciences and you don't realize you know, spectacles, lenses, that you think that they're different, uh, of course you're not going to be able to discover things. So to show people in audiences, there's a pair of uh, uh, reading glasses I bought from the drugstore. My lab is on the 10th floor of a building, so we're looking down, and the important thing, which you all know, just the sky is below, the earth is above. There's something else that's not immediately obvious from this. The parity is reversed. And in a concave mirror, the parity is not reversed, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Trying to represent um, geometrical optics, uh, objects in perspective. We come forward again to almost the time of Van Eyck. Well, you don't need to fit a perfect perspective corrected hexagon to this to realize that there's something not quite right with that. But we come to Van Eyck again. If I magnify that chandelier, it's wonderful, it's elaborate, it's incredible. The thing that's more amazing is that the real painting that chandelier on the real painting is this big. It's as big as my cupped hand. So I've taken something <coughs> that Van Eyck painted that was this big, I've blown it up to uh, 10 feet across, and it maintains this amazing optical-like fidelity. How did Van Eyck do that? There's six arms, there's arms that are forward, back, and we're gonna talk more about that chandelier as we go along. There's a scale to it, the size of a candle, and I don't have time to, um, because we all do want to eat dinner, I don't have time to give you all the background to it. Go to art-optics.com and you can download all of our papers and you can find out whatever you want to know, but we can make estimates from this. 